Hello there. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you doing? Just dandy. Okay. Do you, are you going to be sharing a screen or anything or? I, yeah, I have some photos that okay. I set up for people. Okay. I will make you the co-host then so okay. that you can share your screen and I will keep track of people trying to come in. However, okay. I might have to zip off every once in a while. So, uh, <laughs> It's I was just one of those warnings. Uh, I get that. I was just wonder, thinking about that. I'm like, oh, well, the only way you can get in is you have to knock on my door. And <laughs> well, well yeah, I will be closing my door, but. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. So if I have never done this before, so uh -huh. if I just hit this share screen at the bottom, that should share my own, right? It should. Yeah. You could try it now. It should work. Um... Awesome. whatever whatever's on your screen while we'll be able oh, to see perfect yeah yeah okay. there you go yay <laughs> i don't do this very often i generally <laughs> just do <laughs> i am a participant <laughs> okay. well i haven't quite figured out how to change my name yet you know because i participated in some other ones you know so like the museum will come up yeah but if i need to be on by like myself or by like nebraska museums it's like how do i change that and i still haven't figured that part out your guess is as good as mine because I don't know. I'm just going to leave it like that for right now. How is everything out of your way? Um, pretty good. So good. far, so good. It's nice and cool right now. And of course, that means our museum is incredibly chilly because we can't turn on any heat. But of course, it's supposed to be, eight, you know, inevitably there'll be an 80 degree week there. So but. I had a, a full city kind of like city staff meeting yesterday and we hosted it here at the museum and it was cold <laughs> i'm like we're not turning the heat on until it's like definite <laughs> okay. so it's still just a little bit early and i am going, i have to make some copies go bit, so. go do your thing i'm just gonna hang out at my desk
Good morning, everybody. It is 1031, but I'll give it another minute in case anybody else would like to join. Um, we are recording this, so if you have to step away for anything, um, it will be posted on our um, Nebraska Museums Association website. Um, I think within about a week or so. I'm not entirely sure how long it takes. Um, Karen to get that up there. So uh, I guess I can. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm, oops, I got somebody else coming in. Hold on. <laughs> Just when I think I can start. But that's great. So, there we go. Okay, now we'll get started. Uh, uh, welcome to our monthly musings. Um, this one is on DIY um, preservation, and it's going to be led by Justin Noyd from the Hastings Museum. And uh, like I mentioned before, we are recording this, so you can always go back and watch it or if you want someone else from your organization to, um, to view it, um, by all means do that. Um, I, I'd ask that everybody mute your, your screen so that we don't get any interference. Um, if you have any questions, Jessica, do you want questions as they yeah. come in? Anytime. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so she said anytime you want questions, if you don't feel like you want to interrupt, if you put it in the chat, we'll pass it along. But I am going to turn it over to Jessica here. I'm just trying to adjust myself. Good morning, sure. everybody. Hi, Bonda. <laughs> Hi, Lynn. Um, I'm Jessica Noyd, and I'm the registrar here at the Hastings Museum. Um, I hope I don't really have kind of a, a Thing that I've been doing um, 
then put it together a presentation. I just thought if anybody had any questions for some ideas or um, some pretty specific or unique um, questions on rehousing and storage, just kind of give me a call or you know ask away, and then um, I'll try and answer as best that I can. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I went to EIU um, for their historical administration program, and then I spent a lot of my time with the State Historical Society, especially with the Ford Conservation Center. So um, I particularly really like rehousing and um, that sort of thing. So it's an interest to me. Um, so that's kind of where I put a lot of my main focus on um, while I'm here. And so some of these things that I've that I've got to show you, I've got some pictures of some of the rehousings that I've done um, here at the Hastings Museum. And then I have some resources that um, I use. So I'll just kind of get started. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, it is kind of gets a little overwhelming, the amount of information that comes out. Um, sorry, adjusting myself here. Because I don't necessarily always know what to do or how to do it. You can read the forms or you can take the webinars, you can do all that stuff, but it doesn't generally answer the questions unless you have like a hands on scenario, which I will tell you, I've done tons and tons of boxes and trays and things like that just to get it right. And it's like anything else practice, 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 right? <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that I do is I take um, a lot of webinars through um, FAICs. They have a great area called um, Connecting to Collections. And a few of their webinars that are coming up, I don't know. Can you guys see this one? Yay, you can. I hope. Um, so these are the ones that I actually am going to be doing myself. They're, a lot of their webinars are free, except for the last one down here. It's called C2C um, Care Course. It's like $99, and it's a four to six week course um, that they'll do trainings. And it's a once a week, usually hour to an hour and a half um, webinar. But fundraising for a collections care, money, 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 right? We always are running out of money. Um, here at the museum, we have a very large collection, but we have a very small budget. So um, I have to be kind of a penny pincher when it comes to what I do. Um, so this, this kind of helps to get that idea of how to fundraise for your collection. Um, and this one that's coming up in October is because it's forget the best good and better approaches. This is how I usually approach anything that I do here at the museum is it's better than it was, but is it the best? Maybe not. A lot of it deals with time and funding. Um, and one of the big things for me is space. I don't have a lot of space, so I have to utilize as much as possible. And then this keeping collections safe and storage. Real, real quick, Jessica, yeah. we're only seeing the fossils or the, the tools oh, you are. on the screen. Yeah. How about, can I do this one? Can I do a new share? Oh, I can. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Yep. See, this is what I need. Can you see this now? Yes. Yes. All righty. <laughs> um, so this is the one FAIC. So these are the three that I really like. I've taken a ton of their webinars and um, and if you want to go back, they've got uh, archives that you can do those too, and course archives that you can take a look at. But um, so, like I said, I do a good, better, uh, a good, better, best scenario. Um, I can't always do the best, but I can do better than than a Econo Foods box that I have stuff stored in. Um, okay, I'm gonna try this. Tell me if this is gonna work. I'm gonna stop this here. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to share this one. All right, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, these are kind of the things that I have to get out of here somehow. Um, I got to move you guys. There we go. <laughs> I can't see on my screen. Um, so we're pretty lucky here at the Hastings Museum. We um, received 
a half cent sales tax um, that is kind of dedicated for new collection storage. This is part of a, um, a very long-term phase to do some renovations. But as part of that initial funding, we were able to purchase um, compact storage. So we were able to kind of design. The reason that this had to happen pretty, pretty quickly is because we ended up having um, some water damage and some mold damage to our artifacts in, in our space. Um, as everybody else knows, space is a hot topic and a top priority um, and a hot commodity. But with where we are at here at the Hastings Museum, we can only have our storage in the basement due to engineering codes and weight loads. So we have to kind of um, take that into consideration when we're doing our, our storage and rehousings. So we were able to kind of take a look at our space and look, think about like environmental conditions. Um, the space that, uh, uh, that is a large area um, is one that does have some water pipes going through it, some main drain pipes and sewage pipes and that sort of stuff. So we have to kind of take a look and think about, okay, what can we store in there um, with the kind of iffy conditions? Um, so we are not storing any textiles in that area, but we are staying with some of the, the tougher materials, our rocks and minerals collection, our archaeological collections, um, glass and china. The, the environment temperature and relative humidity is pretty stable because we were able to get a new HVAC unit to run that specific area, but we still have tons of water. Uh, at one point in time, I walked in there and there was like a fountain of water coming up because we had an ice dam <laughs> in our drain pipes that run from the roof to the outside. So that was just one of the things that we have to kind of figure out. So we were able to do um, some drawers. So this is part of our archeological collection. Um, these are the larger pieces that we can sit in drawers. The best thing about these drawers is that they can be lifted out and moved in case of an emergency. Um, some other things. So once again, space is the top priority. If you can see, these are the tiny little scrapers. They're less than an inch. inch. Um, so these are two by three PE bags. And then if you can see, so this is just, these drawers are very similar to the ones below where it's just an empty. So what I did was took some blue board and created dividers so that I can maximize the, the amount of space um, in there. So they've just got stiffeners in them with the, the number. And then that's kind of how um, a few of the other things. So like I said, space is a top priority. Um, so I, and this is something that I learned from the Ford Center was trays, trays, trays. <laughs> trays are amazing because you can get a lot in a small area of a box. So this is just kind of an example of um, some uh, things that we've had to do. Um, so things that take up a lot of space, such as swords, <laughs> um, but if you can get them into a box. And so what this is, is this is tri rod. Unfortunately, no one is ever is making this stuff anymore. Um, they're making, it's a, a ethafoam but it's more of like a trapezoidal, which you can find on Gaylord and stuff like this. But this was stuff that was used as shinking for um, log cabins, um, which was awesome. And I loved it because it was a closed foam. Um, so if you can see, I don't know if you can see right here, these little triangles, those are spacers so that you can lay another tray on top of that to maximize the volume of the box. Um, you can use foam, which I'll show you later on, but these are um, just scraps of blue board that I've used, but due to the weight of the objects on top, it was better because foam can compress down. 
So we just used blue board to be able to keep that up so it didn't press down on top of anything. Um, and that's just a, it's a triangular with, I just hot glued it together on the sides. Um, and then this is what would go up on top. Um, so we've, we always try to keep our associated materials together. So a lot of these are the, um, sorry, my headphones keep falling out. These are the scabbards and stuff that go to the weapons on the bottom. So when I'm rehousing, I'm always thinking about the weight and how items would be used or how to properly be stored later on. Um, and so this is just kind of an example of how that would have would have been. Um, and then we tie them down so that they don't, one of my favorite things to do is called the shake test. When you try and slide it off, or if you put it on the shelf, you shake it around to see if the object slides around and if you need to support it some other places. Um, so this is kind of an example of some trays that we've we've been doing. Um, currently, I'm rehousing our glassware collection. I like to do things in groups. Um, that way, I know exactly what we have. We've the Hastings Museum has been collecting for over a hundred years, and we have never done a full inventory <laughs> of our collection. So that tends to be a bit of a problem. So through this rehousing and the um, renovation of storage, that's the goal. So we just choose, um, we're about five years uh, ahead of schedule, hopefully, um, but we choose uh, specific collections that we're going through. So right now I'm doing house uh, glassware in China. And so I try and get everything together so that I can rehouse it together um, to know, and then that kind of helps me out. So these are just some um, glass, pink depression glass trays that we've had. Um, and so this is what it looks like when you open up the box, you can see just at the foam. So it's, um, that's always a question. I took a webinar where there, um, a couple of the conservators were saying, don't ever use ethafoam, don't use polyethylene, stay away from plastics. Um, and then that kind of has freaked everybody out <laughs> in that seminar because we were like, but you've been pushing this for years. So we're trying to, I'm trying to limit the amount of um, polyethylene that we're using, but sometimes um, because you just can't <laughs> really. So because of what we, um, the, sorry, lost my train of thought. Because of the um, uh, movable shelving, there's always that vibration. And especially if I'm doing glass, then I like to make sure that I've created some sort of cushioning so that it doesn't scrape or do anything like that accidentally hit against each other. So if you can see right here, I just have a little foam so that the two don't mash against each other and chip. Um, so this is what it looks like from the top. And then below it are some uh, plates of kind of the same set. And then I took a picture to show what it would look like on the inside. So these are just, um, I bought some ethafoam planking from Gaylord and I just cut it into strips, cut it down to the size that I need it. So I use, I use my scraps like galore. These have been scraps, these are scraps. And then um, because the ethafoam planking is kind of rough on the edges, I try not to allow that to scrape the glass. So then I I have scraps of Valara foam to prevent the scraping on that. Um, so that's what it would look like inside the box. Now you can, I have the space, I have the opportunity to do this. Um, one of the reasons that I kind of chose this way to do rehousing of plates is because when you start to put plates on top of each other, even if you have foam between them, sometimes we forget that the plates are heavy. And then when you keep putting them on, it creates a pressure and then you can crack or break your plates on the bottom. So this was just kind of a way to help prevent that. Um, so we, I just use record storage boxes, those bankers boxes. Um, and then I cut the trace to the size on the inside. And then if you can see right here, I just have a 
a notch on the side for, on both sides to finger hold to lift them up that way. Um, and so then I am a huge fanatic of, of trays. <laughs> Um, I kind of, I, and because I love this stuff so much, I love to rehouse. Um, I take ideas from everywhere. So one time I was trying to figure out how to store my um, Christmas ornaments and they always have those ready set packets from like Target or something. And they had the the dividers that let you put them in there. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea for a bunch of things. So I've taken that idea and I've done it for glassware for cups and trays and you'll see later on various areas or various other things so these are kool-aid cups there's a little plastic kool-aid man with the smiley on them um i have a lot of them because we're the kool-aid museum so um this way i can get 24 cups into or these little mugs into one banker's box um and then on the size of my shelf, I can get three of those. So that's a lot uh, that doesn't take up a lot of space because it helps with the volume um, for the, this area that I have. And so I've just made trays the size and then I've lined them with uh, ethafoam, with rolled foam. And then I've got cotton twill handles to lift them up out of the box to get to the bottom layers. Um, so yeah, um, and a lot of these things, you can buy um, these dividers already pre-made from Gaylord or another um, resources area. But what I found is that they don't necessarily fit in the areas that I need. So I've just, I, I make them myself. Um, because I'm trying to maximize the amount of space and I don't want a tiny little thing to be falling around because then to me that's just a little bit of wasted space. Um, so I just make them myself. Now this is something everybody's probably going to know. Everybody has seen the um, cylinder, the Edison cylinders, right? Um, one of my questions was, was, how do I store these? Because I didn't want the I didn't want them to be stored in their in the original cardboard, um, so I had to figure out a way. And then this is just at the foam that I kind of shaped into a star, and you can see down here there's some foam there. This was a way to just stick them on to help prevent that um, from there. Um, and then I wanted to keep their the um, original cylinders associated. So you can see right here, this would be the cylinder for its original box. Um, and then here's just a closer example of it. Um, yeah. And then does anybody else have any of those? Um, they're called organ rollers. They look like music box rollers and they have um, iron or steel pins in them to play in the music. Well, one of the questions that I had was because I had no idea how to rehouse these because the um, I had to think about not damaging the pins. Um, so this was kind of what I ended up coming up with. And if you can see, these are dividers. Um, this is how they're stored, but I was able to just cut little rings and then line them with Valara. So this gets the pins up about a half an inch off the board and it's just supported, um, right here at the edges on the wood. So it, none of these pins are, are being pressed down, have any weight pressure or anything like that on them. And then I just lined the edge with Valara for some um, cushioning because I made there are four or five trays in each box. Um, my favorite are bankers boxes because you can get a lot into that small area. Not everything is pretty. <laughs> um, not everything takes a lot of time. 
And that's one of the things that you kind of have to decide, is it good, is it better, is it best? Will it work for now? Um, and for us, this has kind of worked. This is our how we store our canteens for our military collection. Um, my A lot of my main concern is, especially for my storage area, is water. Um, if we have a flood or if we have a burst pipe or anything like that, I've tried to put everything into boxes to make it easier in this space to be able to get everything out quickly. Um, these poor canteens have had several issues. Um, a few years ago, we were laying some new concrete and it was a self-leveler and it, it dropped, dripped down onto some of these canteens. So it's just wrapped in Tyvek in a box. Um, for me and for what we do here, it's best to create a barrier between a box. Not all boxes are created equal, um, just based on money. So I also really like to make boxes. I'm kind of a big dork like that. So I, this is how we rehouse um, our military helmet collection. Unfortunately, we have a lot of helmets from World War I that are on loan. Um, and so I had to figure out a way to store those. So if you can see, tri rod has been my favorite thing. Um, and then just some, uh, sorry, cotton twill tape so that it doesn't move around. And each box was made specifically for each helmet. And if you can kind of see, this is how they are. Um, so we can get three helmets on specific shelves. Um, and then if you can't put it in a box, how else are you gonna protect it? So these are, um, I'm actually pretty proud of these. These are tiny examples of salesmen, silent salesmen. So these were um, on display in a furniture store. So you could kind of take a look and see what kind of couch you wanted. They had been sitting out for a long time. We ended up having um, a mouse infestation about 20 years ago that got into them. Um, and then some of the mold. So in order to kind of prevent for light and dust and that sort of stuff, I just made tiny little um, furniture covers out of Tyvek. Um, this is, you know, Tyvek comes in varying size or styles. You can get it in paper or you can get it in a soft Tyvek, which is sewable. And so you can even wash the Tyvek, um, which was kind of a big plus for me. Um, and so then some of the things is, like we were super lucky to get that half cent sales tax, but not necessarily everything doesn't have to be purchased from Gaylord or, you know, purchased from Space Saver or anything like that. Um, we do a lot of in-house building. And if you can see, these are some gun racks that one of our uh, maintenance men built for us specifically two size for the space that we were going to store them in. Um, if you can see, there's two rows. There's a row up here and a row up down below. And um, we painted it. Each one has a different color um, just to identify how we store our guns. Um, and then we allowed it to off gas for actually a couple of months um, while we were doing some more construction. And then everything is covered with marble seal, um, which creates a barrier between the wood and the metal of, of the guns. And then in addition, we have these little areas um, where the guns lay up against there. They have a cushioning of Valara behind them, and then they're tied into place and they're kind of put down on, um, these are movable units, but if you can tell right down here, we've made it so that um, it's spaces for pallet jacks to move them around. And then just a few more examples. So we have some of our smaller guns. 
but we were using every available space for our large military guns. And even in the back behind the guns or some of the cases and machine guns that we don't generally get out all that often. Um, some of the things that for us, we always have to be aware of is um, one, caution heavy cartridge boxes. <laughs> if you haven't ever played around with um, weapons cartridges, they can get kind of heavy. So it's just for other people coming in, interns, volunteers, you know, new staff members, they kind of know. Um, if anybody else, um, house museums, stuff like that, you may find that you have like just weird taxidermy hanging around. Um, we have a large taxidermy exhibit um, and obviously, obviously, but uh, we have a ton that are back in storage. I don't know if anybody knew this, but in the Hastings Museum, prior to becoming a, um, a city museum, they used to do their own taxidermy here. <laughs> so in the basement is where they had their own room. Um, so we have all the chemicals, lead and mercury and arsenic and that sort of stuff. Now it's, you can get your own testing um, strips that you can do to test if for those various um, poisons and metals, heavy metals. But I uh, go with a side of caution. So I just pretty much treat everything as if it's toxic. Just tell, please don't lick it, you know, that sort of stuff. So in order to do that, because we haven't tested everything, um, we have boxes for each one of our um, each one of our, uh, mounts so that it kind of, when we move, when we move our compact storage so that that air movement doesn't throw that all up. Um, so we have our own boxes that we've created. These are open flap lid. So the lids come off and the front flaps fold down, which makes it easier to move the mount in and out. So you don't have to affect that. But also we do use caution with handling possible arsenic. And then that way we have a picture on it. So you know exactly what is in the box. So you don't have to go searching for what you're looking for. Um, and I think that's basically it. A few of the tips and tricks that I've done is um, I buy in bulk. And if I can, I buy giant boxes of 40 by 60 blue board and I use that and I make my own boxes um we purchase rolled film I'm not happy with it um it's not the greatest but we buy it from uline um so we can get very large pieces of stuff like that so I pretty much make all of my own housings I generally don't purchase um ready-made storage from Gaylord or anything like that, because it doesn't fit my spaces. <laughs> um, if I had a lot of space and if I had a great deal like the Smithsonian or you know stuff like that, but I have unique areas that I have to fit. So it's just easier for me to kind of do them on my own. Um, so sometimes I can't always buy the um, polyethylene bags and the the better ideas that are recommended. So um, we store our stuff in Ziploc bags um, because they're food safe and they're uh, inert plastic as well. So that's kind of kind of how we do it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Please ask. <laughs> Anything I can help with? Any suggestions? Any ideas? Any questions? I have no idea. Oh. Hi, Lynn. Okay. Hi, I've got a question. Sure. Um, so um, as you can imagine, and you probably have this problem in your collection, storing mm -hmm. flat artwork. So yes. mm -hmm. large format photographs other sorts of big paper documents you mm -hmm. can spend thousands of dollars yes. <laughs> on wonderful wonderful flat files 
or you sometimes have well-meaning friends who say, oh, we've got this old wooden flat file from so-and-so's architectural firm, don't yeah. you want it? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so, so two questions. Number yeah. one, can you do anything with a wooden flat file to buffer it or create separations so that you can safely store work or should you just really say thanks but use it for your button collection because <laughs> we're not gonna well uh, I, uh, I'm sure everybody has had that issue right everybody's wonderful um, it kind of depends. Like if you can afford a flat file, great. That's wonderful. But if you could use it, there are ways around it. This is where it comes to this like good, better, best thing. Mm -hmm. It's better, you know, than rolled up or whatever. There is this, um, and I totally, totally just blanked on it. Um, it's the silver. It's not mylar. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Anyway, yes, you can. You can layer it. You can buffer it. Basically, so when anybody is talking about like do we, dealing with wood shelving, that sort of stuff, with woods, you, you kind of have to decide. Um, it's kind of the same way with boxes. Do you want to store paper in wood cabinets? And it depends on what kind of paper and how important it is to your collection, you know, like that's how I would address it. If it was a charcoal painting or something like that, um, which we don't have a lot of, um, but we do have lots of maps and things like that, I would either try and paint the inside of the drawers um, with a latex, you know, with a paint, let it off gas to kind of seal that. Um, there is, once again, I'm really sorry. It's not Mylar. It's Marvel Seal. Marvel Seal. Thank you. See, yeah. uh, Marvel Seal. So I, we would probably put Marvel Seal in. We actually uh, do have a lot of in um, custom built um, drawers from the 1930s that we do store, have stored stuff in. So we covered the inside of that with marble seal and then um, put a mylar uh, just on top of that as well um, to kind of help with that. So it, it depends on what you're going to store in that. If, if it's a metal piece, I wouldn't store it in a wood case because the acids from the wood would affect the metals. Sure. But if you need to store metals in there, then, you know, obviously create some sort of barrier, mm -hmm. put, put the metal, if it's jewelry or buttons or silver, put it in a polyethylene bag and you can store it in that way. Okay. So it's well, something that I've used in the past before, and we still yeah. currently use. Okay. That's very helpful. So that was question one. Mm -hmm. Question two, um, we have built some portfolio boxes yes. um, ourselves, out, but out of foam core rather than blue board. So is foam core bad or is blue board better or does it make any difference? Or... It does, you know, there's, and you can talk to Vonda at the Ford Center. The Ford Center no, is really sure. great. Yeah. <laughs> you guys can always talk to them. They're fantastic. Yes, but, no, um, but you can, this is where it's always a little confusing to me is because there are, there are conservators out there that tout, you know, Coroplast, which is the polyethylene blue board. It's just a plastic, um, that they, you can make boxes out of mm -hmm. they, some tout foam core, some tout gator board, you know, it's just kind of whatever you have foam core generally doesn't make a great box just because it's got that squishiness to right. it yes. and you have the ability like it flattens I'm not saying that blue board doesn't flatten but blue board has a little bit of a better support system because of the um, corrugation in it 
but foam core is just, I, I mean, if you, you've already made it, so why not? Yeah. Well, no, but you're absolutely right because we have the, the closures are tie closures. And so mm -hmm. the, the pressure from the tie closures yeah. you know, makes a little divot in the, it does. And it, and it kind of depends. Like if, if you've got foam core, if it's a, if it's a material that you have and it's already, if you know, it's stable, then use it. Right. Like, I mean, for me that just use it because stuff is expensive. <laughs> Oh yeah. I think it's uh, just been the durability of it that people, you know, because yeah. of that compression and there there are different types too, so you probably want to get the acid free versus, mm -hmm. you know, you got to just make sure material, materials are good. But, right. And that's and that's the one thing that is always like whenever I give tours and I talk to um volunteers or interns or even just like our board members, I always have to remind them that what what we're doing in museums and as like the conservation and why we do the things we do is we're just slowing down deterioration we can't stop it like that's that's sure. we can't keep it forever you know mm -hmm. um whether or not we want to there are just things especially and that's something that we have to focus on kind of and it's something that like i'm really thinking about right now because we collect Kool-Aid materials, but we collect current Kool-Aid materials and throw and plastics was not, you know, that's something that we really have to think about and figure out how we're going to store these because this plastic is not meant to last forever. Right. Um, so we have to figure out ways that we can kind of try and address that. And it's better that you know, I mean, it's just better. It's, it's a way to figure out we're just slowing it down. Acid free does not mean acid free forever. <laughs> and unfortunately, which is what people think is like, oh, I've got acid free boxes. Well, that's great, but they don't last forever because whatever you store in that you're creating its own environment. So the off gassing of sure. the leather and is going to affect whatever they put into the material. So, you know, I mean, I have some boxes that I recently, or not recently, well, probably recently, five years recently, bought um, some banker's boxes. They are not the greatest, they're acid free, <laughs> but they're not, they're not the best. They're not the, the wonderful blue board boxes, mm -hmm. but, they will work and so i have had to because i had to buy 200 of them and when you're doing large projects you have to figure out okay what can i do to save money mm -hmm. so that's where like the ziploc stuff the food safe comes into play and then that also is where like the boxes and creating a barrier for i know that i'm not going to store metals in these these boxes because they're not the greatest but can i store glass in it because glass isn't necessarily affected like it's not as effect it acids do not affect glass as much as they do metals so can i store my my glass in there and feel pretty safe about it yeah can i store wood in there well wood is acid this is acid let's create a barrier we'll wrap it we'll put some paper around it and store it that way so you just kind of have to be realistic and, and realize that, yes, we are striving to be the best, but sometimes it's the artifact itself that isn't allowing us to store it properly. Thank you. Gosh, sorry. 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 <laughs> anybody else? Does anybody have any like weird things that they don't know how to store or what to do with? Because yeah, I always do. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll come, I'll come back with a weird. Sure. <laughs> Sorry if I interrupted somebody else. So, um, paper tracings mm -hmm. that were used by a gravestone carver. Oh yeah. And the um. So they're, so they're, um, 
some sort of tracing paper mm -hmm. with graphite. Yeah. But there, they also were probably exposed to gasoline because <laughs> the gravestone carver took gasoline in a rag. Oh yeah, to clean off the, the stove stone. And then put the tracing paper down. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to be that yellow yet or anything. And they've obviously not been stored except just in stacks. You know, they haven't mm -hmm. been separated. Yeah. So do you just sort of say, you know what? It's they're they're 50 years old already. Some of them are a hundred years mm -hmm. old. Maybe we just let it be, or or do you try to figure out how to? Well, I, interleave so, them you know, or... that's uh, are they important? That's like I think is your number one question. Yeah, is well, are they important? Yeah, or or is the information the thing that's important? And so a digital version of them, you know, because this is this is a gravestone family operation that operated for more than a hundred years you know so there's mm -hmm. like layers of information but there, yeah and that and then like so if that was a donation that we would have you know had to think about we would sit there and be like okay what's the most important thing like do we keep a couple like one or two of the better condition ones mm -hmm. and then scan or photograph the other ones because uh -huh. in this day and age find a grave is a place where you can find that information they have photos of the you know stones themselves yeah that yeah. sort of thing and if you want it to be like an example of what people have done like genealogists have done in the past that sort of stuff then yeah like you can definitely try and save the best ones um now whether or not like that's a, another question for the board center um <laughs> on how you do that but uh, what i probably more than likely would do is just to get some of the heavy duty rag board mm -hmm. and i would probably cut so that it's at least on that because if if it's cotton rag board you're better off than doing it on a paper board Mm -hmm. a, a wood pulp base um and then that way you don't have to kind of like that concern of the gasoline and the remnants of that once um, again if you have the funds right if, if the, you the have top the top line the top line thing would be getting um, a micro chamber type of paper mm -hmm. um and then that'll help absorb a lot of that kind of stuff that, that kind and of it, stuff it needs to be replaced obviously but yeah they and once again, I, I, we wouldn't be able to afford it. So I would just do the yeah. rag board <laughs> right. and just yeah. like, the, just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nice heavy duty board. Like it's foldable. So you can create your own. I mean, I've used it to make, um, supports for lantern glass, glass lantern slides, but so you can do that sort of thing, but it's a nice support where you don't actually have to mess with the paper, that tissue paper itself. Um, and then you can just use it that way. And I would probably more than likely what I would have do is for the edges. Same way you, I mean, we all know those, the photo edging, like the photo corners to put into photo albums. I would probably just make something of that out of mylar on the corners to keep it steady. And then just that way. Um, and then store it however you can. But once again, it's just, how much money, how much time do you yeah. want to put forth? Yeah. And is it worth the effort? Now, if you have a hundred of them, I would probably, I would probably keep one or two and then photograph the rest. No. Yeah. Okay. And just keep a representation or an example of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of paper going on there, Lynn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want to see our house. It's actually a storage <laughs> unit, not not a house. Nah, that's fine. That's my house too. I have a I have a quick question about like things like matchbooks. Yes. And that sort of thing. I mean, uh -huh. how do you do you if somebody gives you a match, you know, like we take a lot of advertising things, including yes. matchbooks. Uh -huh. Do you keep the matches? Do you take them out? I mean, how take do you them store out. them? 
I take the I take the matches out because that's that's not the important part. The important part is the advertising. So um, depending on what it is, um, sometimes you know some of those have the the um, oh goodness the Dragboard. staple the staple in it at the bottom. So I take the staple and the matches out, okay. and then I store it that way. So so anything else that's kind of like in that vein, you just take out the, for lack of a better term, the bad part. <laughs> yes. I mm -hmm. mean, so I'm just, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I do anyway. Now right. that's not saying that I don't have some pretty dangerous and flammable things in my collection. <laughs> um, in our military collection, we do have cordite, which was, is a flammable material. Um, but we do have some examples of that. So we keep that in the safe in a safe space. Um, a few years ago, I ran across a at it was a door to door salesman that took these things and it's a safety device security device for your home safe and you attached it to the safe and it had tear gas in it. <laughs> so we ended up having to get rid of that and uh, called the state patrol. They came out and disposed of it um that sort of way but things like that but yeah matches we we do take away and try and remove um and that and like and that's some of the the things that probably people don't think about either um when you get new toys like if you get toys from the 70s the 80s that sort of stuff take out the battery <laughs> um if you need like you know so what what i do is if we just recently got a dancing troll doll. She sings and she lights up and does all of that. So I recorded what the songs were, what she did, and then I removed the battery. So we don't store that with it and have that damage there as well. Um, yeah, same thing for a lot of other things. So any other questions? So a lot of like some of the really things that I kind of want everybody to take away from this is um, one, reach out, please email me. Uh, I have, I will, sh I'm an open book. I'll share whatever, whatever we, I, we do. Um, but there's obviously, I mean, we all know in this field that there's the, the, worst things that you can do like there's things that you just don't do but a lot of it is um you're not the only one that has these questions you're not the only one that has these concerns or is overwhelmed and there are people out there that don't want you to have to reinvent the wheel um for some of this stuff and think about it in the way of when you're trying to rehouse something or you're trying to store something, how was it originally supposed to be used? Um, if it's a hat, you know, like a bonnet or something like that with textiles, it wasn't meant to be stored flat. It was meant to be worn. So you can figure out a way that you can store it that way. If you just have to stuff it full of tissue, you know, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but there are, there are resources out there for you. The Ford Center is a fantastic resource. Um, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. I'm going to share this again. Hold on. I did not do very well on this. How do I share? This is why I don't do this a lot. Okay. Um, so once again, these are just like the places, but these are some of my favorite places to go to. Um, one of the things is how to make a box. <laughs> Boxes are kind of, they're, they're really are truly an art form. <laughs> um, uh, it took me a number of years to be able to make a really nice box. Um, but these, but how to make a box is the, is the basic tenant on how to make a tray um, within your, like to utilize your space of bankers boxes and things like that. So um, this is a really great video. She does a really great job of explaining how to make a box. And I can send this to um, Aaron or you guys can email me if you want this sort of thing. 
There is also um, a website called Stash, Storage Techniques for Art, Science, and History. And this is a great website. There's not a lot on it, but it's great to help you kind of, um, it's a way, it's a place where people and registrars, conservators, all that sorts of stuff, curators, put how to store things, how they've, how they've stored theirs and giving you an idea of, of how to do that. Um, I really love Stash. I have taken some ideas from them for rehousings and I've kind of modified them for my own, um, my own collection. The Ford Conservation Center, they have a resources site and on there they've got a lot of stuff. They've got some rehousing things that can help you. Um, one of my favorite ones that was developed by Rebecca Cashman is um, pillow supports. So like when you're doing quilts or if you've got a heavy Native American collection um, and you've got a heavy dress, it kind of, you create um, internal support so that you don't crease your, your fabric. And so it's created in an S form. Love it. I use it all the time now. Um, and then there's like ways of how to tray, things like that. Um, and then another one that I like is the Canadian Conservation Institute. They have their own kind of conservagrams um, that help and give you some ideas for rehousing techniques. Um, so if, if it doesn't necessarily specifically work for you, feel free to just create your own because you guys know your collection better than anybody else. Um, and you know, your, your limitations, you know, your space limitations, you know, where your storage limitations are. Um, so just kind of keep those in mind. And one of the things that I really, really want y'all <laughs> to know is that you're you're doing great all of us all of us are doing fantastic are there's always room for improvement i look back at some rehousings that i did even five years ago and think what was i thinking um just know that you're not the only ones that's struggling and you're doing the best you can and later on it may you might find out that what you did then was best then, was best practices at that point in time. Um, like I said, the one thing that is kind of in my head is plastics may not be the best way to store items. Do we have enough research? Who knows? But it's what we were told and it was best practices then. So we'll continue on until it's, until something different comes along, I guess. So, anybody else? Hey, Jessica. Yeah. Uh, April White over at the Frank Museum in Kearney. Um, I put out the monthly newsletter for yeah. MMA and was wondering, would you be willing to send me this resources document? Because I think it would be good to add it to the newsletter under the helpful resources section. I think a lot of people could benefit from a lot of this. It looks very helpful. So Yeah, it, and like I said, these are... I really like to do goofy stuff like this. This is my favorite part of my job is to rehouse. I can do it for mm -hmm. hours at a time. So these are some of the ones that have really helped me. And I can get some more on there for like specific um, ideas that other people have. Okay, awesome. I'll I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat for you. Okay, that wanna sounds good. Grab that and whenever you can, no rush, just whenever you could send it over because I'll just kind of pick and choose some every so often and put them in there. I think, I think these, these look really helpful. So thank they're, you for they're putting this together. Yeah, they're super awesome. And I think we have a couple of these on our website as well. And I know that the Canadian Conservation Institute mm -hmm. is on there as well. Um, I'm pretty sure the Ford Center is under different things, but we'll make sure that we put these on there. Um, um, also, I mean, the, the newsletter, you know, goes out great and, you know, sometimes it's, you can't always find that email that got shoved down, you know, <laughs> it mm -hmm. could be, you could pop up in the morning and by the end of the day, it's, you've got a hundred more. So <laughs> I completely understand. Yeah. And, and once again, just, uh, feel free to reach out. I have, and if you have any questions or if I don't know anything, I will definitely, um, let you like help you out. Um, if you have any questions, just please call email, send a passenger pigeon, whatever.
and I'm more than welcome to more than happy to help. And I'll even, you know, and I've got um, because I really like myself and I like my pretty housings. So I've got tons of photos of people need anything just to kind of give you examples of of what we've done here. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I, I will do a quick reminder for, for those of you who are Nebraska Museum Association members, um, not to pitch Gaylord, but we do, Nebraska Museum Association members do get a discount when they order through Gaylord, but I think if you're also an MPMA member, they have uh, collective purchasing and that sort of thing. So, but if anybody does need some ideas of where to purchase some of these things, um, there's all sorts, there's Gaylord, I think there's what Hollinger, Metal Edge, and there's a few others out there as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we have some of those on our website as well, but. Yeah, and, um, if, and if you guys have the ability to, that's, um, I don't have a very big budget. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, it's a very, it's an incredibly small budget. Um, so MPMA has been a lifesaver. Their co-op has been fantastic. And if you guys can afford to become an institutional member, that makes up for it in and of itself. So, yeah. Okay. I think we're just about out of time. We timed it just right. Yay. <laughs> so if there's nothing else, again, I'll remind you, this will be up on the website, I think within a week. I think that's kind of what Karen's goal is maybe within two weeks. Um, other than that, our next one is in um, October, October uh, 21st. And I believe it's on like paranormal stuff. I think I think the the, the, the people from rail trails and rails at Kearney are gonna be leading that one. So that should be kind of interesting and pretty appropriate for October. <laughs> so if there's no other questions, thank you everybody. And I Thanks, hope you guys. have a, a a great afternoon and, and weekend and happy fall to everybody. So with that, we'll let you everybody get it back on. Enjoy your day. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica. Oh, she left already. <laughs>